When we think about newly diagnosed myeloma, there are a couple of different settings where that really comes into play. And there have been some artificial guidelines of eligible versus non-eligible for transplant. Uh, that in Europe means 65 or older or younger than 65. And I think in the U.S. we don't take it quite so clear as a line. And in fact, at our center, we'll transplant up to and sometimes at age 80. So it's really more about performance status than age as a determinant of therapy. We know that there are several guidelines that suggest a triplet now has become a standard for younger, fitter patients. And so the triplets typically involve either an IMID and a proteasome inhibitor together, such as VRD or KRD. There's certainly data on IRD as well. Um, and then um, uh, the use of cyclophosphamide in combination with a proteasome inhibitor as well, so VCD or KCD. Um, in the transplant ineligible setting, I think um, lenalidomide and dexamethasone has become a standard go-to because of its ease of administration and tolerability. Uh, there's data from the SWOG study suggesting RVD has good activity there. RVD light is clearly active. And recently, we've seen data with daratumumab in combination with melphalan, prednisone, and bortezomib that clearly was superior to MPV in the setting of frailer, older transplant patients, transplant ineligible patients. At our center, it is a go-to approach to use the RVD-based approach, the imid proteasome inhibitor combination. Even in patients that present with renal failure that are in the hospital, for instance, we'll use VTD in those patients and really try and avoid the use of cyclophosphamide, uh, mostly because it's our belief, and there's now some emerging data suggesting low-dose alkylators may actually make the mutation burden worse. Uh, in the long term and make it harder to salvage patients. It's very anecdotal data, but certainly that's a concern we have. Um, for frail or older patients, we probably go back and forth between RVD light, which is a modification of dosing and schedule for both bortezomib and lenalidomide, or with Lendex. And I think we're all really excited to see data on Lendex plus DARA, which we think will become another standard potentially, as well as Lendex plus elotuzumab. Uh, because I think that would be potentially another easier approach for frailer patients. I think, you know, the whole idea and questions of sequencing and that, that's come up over and over again, especially since we have so many drugs in the context of myeloma, to me it's important when a patient presents to hit them with the most effective treatments you have available because that's likely when the disease is most sensitive. And so I don't think about saving drugs for later. Uh, because I know that through clinical trials, we'll always have something else to use down the road. And so we use combinations early, combinations in the relapse setting, and then again, try to use combinations as much as we can unless performance status really becomes a limiting factor. When you're thinking about individualized treatments, I think it's important to realize that you want to give the most effective therapy you can for almost all patients on the upfront setting. So our choice of initial induction is really defined more by frailty than it is by a person's genetics or by high risk versus standard risk in the context of newly diagnosed myeloma. Where we put in the, the rub of personalization of therapy is in the maintenance setting. So patients that have high-risk disease get maintained differently than patients that have standard-risk disease, and we found that to be very effective.